It was a great gray black hood of horror moving over the floor of the sea. It slid through the soft ooze like a monstrous mantle of slime, obscenely animated with questing life. It was by turns viscid and fluid. At times it flattened out and flowed through the carpet of mud like an inky pool. Occasionally it paused seeming to shrink in upon itself and reared up out of the ooze until it resembled an irregular cone or a, or a gigantic hood. Although it possessed no eyes, it had a marvelously developed sense of touch and it possessed a sensitivity to minute vibrations which was almost akin to telepathy. It was plastic, essentially shapeless. It could shoot out long tentacles until it bore a resemblance to a nightmare squid or a huge starfish. It could retract itself into a round flattened disc or squeeze into an irregular hunched shape so that it looked like a black boulder sunk on the bottom of the sea. It had prowled the black water endlessly. It had been formed when the earth and the seas were young. It was almost as old as the ocean itself. It moved through a night which had no beginning and no dissolution. The Black Sea Basin where it, lurked, where it lurked had been dark since the world began, an environment only a little less inimical than the stupendous gulfs of interplanetary space. It was animated by a single, unceasing, never satisfied drive, a ferocious, insatiable hunger. It could survive for months without food, but minutes after eating, it was as ravenous as ever. Its appetite was appalling and incalculable. On the icy, black, on the icy ink black floor of the sea, the battle for survival was savage, hideous, and usually brief. But for the shape of moving slime, there was no battle. It ate whatever came its way, regardless of size, shape, or disposition. It absorbed microscopic plankton and giant squid with equal assurance. Had its surface been less fluid, it might have retained the circular scars left by the grappling suckers of the wildly threshing deepwater squid, or the jagged tooth marks of the anachronistic frill shark. But as it was, neither left any evidence of, a, of its absorption. When the lifting curtain of living slime swayed out of the mud and closed upon them, their fiercest death throes came to nothing. The horror did not know fear. There was nothing to be afraid of. It ate whatever moved or tried not to move. And it had never encountered anything which could in turn eat it. If a squid sucker or a shark's tooth tore into the mass of its viscosity, the rent flowed in upon itself and immediately closed. If a segment was detached, it could be retrieved and absorbed back into the hole. The black mantle reigned supreme in its savage world of slime and silence. It groped greedily and endlessly through the mud, eating, 
and never sleeping, never resting. If it lay still, it was only to trap food, which, might, which otherwise might be lost. If it rushed with terrifying speed across the slimy bottom, it was never to, never to escape an enemy, but always to flop its hideous fluidity upon its sole and inevitable query, food. It had evolved out of the muck and slime of the primitive seafloor, and it was as alien to ordinary terrestrial life as the weird denizens of some wild planet in a distant galaxy. It was an anachronistic experiment of nature compared to which the saber-toothed tiger, the woolly mammoth, and even Tyrannosaurus, the slashing, murderous king of the great earth reptiles, were as tame, weak entities. Had it not been for a vast volcanic upheaval on the bottom of the ocean basin, the black horror would have crept out its entire existence on the silent sea ooze without ever manifesting its hideous powers to mankind. Fate, in the form of a violent subterranean explosion, covering huge areas of the ocean's floor, hurled it out of its black slime world and sent it spinning toward the surface. Had it been an ordinary deep water fish, it never would have survived the experience. The explosion itself, or the drastic lessening of water pressure as it shot toward the surface, would have destroyed it. But it was no ordinary fish. Its viscosity, or plasticity, or whatever it was that constituted its essentially amoebic structure, permitted it to survive. It reached the surface sl slightly stunned and flopped on the surging waters like a great blob of black rubber. Immense waves stirred up the subterranean explosion, swept it swiftly towards shore, and because it was somewhat stunned, it did not try to resist the roaring mountains of water. Along with scattered ash, pumice, and the puffed bodies of dead fish, the black horror was hurled toward a beach. The huge waves carried it more than a mile inland, far beyond the strip of sandy shore, and deposited it in the midst of a deep, brackish swamp area. As luck would have it, the submarine explosion and subsequent tidal wave took place at night, and therefore the slime horror was not immediately subjected to a new and hateful experience, light. Although the midnight darkness of the storm-lashed swamp did not begin to compare to the Stygian blackness of the sea bottom, where even violent rays of the spectrum could not penetrate, the marsh darkness was nevertheless deep and intense. As the water of the great wave receded, sluicing back through the thorn jungle and back out to sea, the black horror clung to a mud bank surrounded by a rank growth of cattails. It was aware of the sudden, startling change in its environment, and for some time it lay motionless concentrating its attention on obscure internal readjustment, which the absence of crushing pressure and a surrounding cloak 
of frigid seawater demanded. Its adaptability was incredible and horrifying. It achieved in a few hours what an ordinary creature could have attained only through a process of gradual evolution. Three hours after the titanic wave flopped it onto the mud bank, it had undergone swift organic changes, which left it relatively at ease in its new environment. In fact, it felt lighter and more mobile than it, had, than it ever had before in its sea basin existence. As it flung out feelers and attuned itself to the minutest vibrations and emanations of the swamp area, its pristine hunger drive reasserted itself with overwhelming urgency. And the tail which its sensory apparatus returned to the monstrous something which served as a brain excited it tremendously. It sensed at once that the swamp was filled with luscious tidbits of quivering food, more food, and food of a greater variety than it had ever encountered on the cold floor of the sea. Its savage, incessant hunger seemed unbearable. Its slimy mass was swept by a shuddering wave of anticipation. Sliding off the mud bank, it slithered, it slithered over the cattails into an adjacent area consisting of deep black pools interspersed with water lug, logged tussocks. Weed stalks stuck up out of the water, and the decayed trunks of fallen trees floated half submerged in the larger pools. Ravenous with hunger, it sloshed into the bog area, flicking its fluid tentacles about. Within minutes, it had snatched up several fat frogs and a number of small fish. These, however, merely titillated its appetite. Its hunger turned into a kind of ecstatic fury it commenced a systematic hunt, plunging to the bottom of each pool and quickly but carefully exploring every inch of its oozy bottom. The first creature of any size which it encountered was a muskrat. An immense cur curtain of adhesive slime suddenly swept out of the darkness and closed upon it and squeezed. Heartened and wetted by its find, the hood of horror rummaged the rank pools with renewed zeal. When it surfaced, it carefully probed the tussocks for anything that might have, es have escaped it in the water. Once it snatched up a small bird nesting in some swamp grass. <clears throat> Occasionally, it slithered up the criss-cross trunks of fallen trees, bearing them down with its unspeakable slimy bulk, and hung briefly, suspended like a great dripping curtain of black marsh mud. It was approaching a somewhat less swampy and more deeply wooded area when it gradually became aware of a subtle change in its new environment. It paused, hesitating, and remained half in and half out of a small pond near the edge of the nearest trees. Although it had absorbed 25 or 30 pounds of food in the form of frogs, fish, water snakes, the muskrat, and a few smaller creatures, 
Its fierce hunger had not left it. Its monstrous appetite urged it on, and yet something held it anchored in the pond. What it sensed but could not literally see was the rising sun spreading a gray light over the swamp. The horror had never encountered any illumination except that generated by the grotesque fluorescent appendages of various deep sea fishes. Natural light was totally unknown to it. As the dawn light strengthened, breaking through the scattering storm clouds, the black slime monster, fresh from the inky floor of the sea, sensed that something utterly unknown was flooding in upon it. Light was hateful to it. It cast out quick feelers, hoping to catch and crush the light. But the more frenzied its efforts became, the more intense and abhorred aura surrounding it. Sorry, the more intense became the abhorred aura surrounding it. At length, as the sun rose visibly above the trees, the horror in baffled rage rather than in fear grudgingly slid back into the pond and burrowed into the soft ooze of its bottom. There it remained while the sun shone and the small creatures of the swamp ventured forth on furtive errands.